So um, we're doing intelligence, which is a fun chapter anyways. And we talk a lot about genetics and the environment in this chapter because it is really an, an outcropping of the eugenics movement, which we have talked a lot about in this class. Um, it, intelligence wasn't, we didn't start studying intelligence because of eugenics. We actually started studying it because of French socialists. Um, there was some guys in France who wanted to find out which kids were struggling and try to get them extra help. Uh, and so they designed the first intelligence test, but then the eugenics, eugenicists latched onto that. It was, um, I don't know what this is. It was something that was viewed as, um, very helpful to the eugenics movement to be able to test whether people were smart or not. Uh, but we do now know that intelligence is not simply genetic. Obviously, we know the education you get is going to play a big role in it. Um, but genetics is part of it. So you can be born with the potential to be smart or the potential to be not so smart, um, depending on what your parents gave you. So be careful of who you marry and make babies with, because you could be dooming your child to, to not being super intelligent. Um, so let's get into it. First of all, what is intelligence? What does it mean? If I say you're intelligent, or you think of yourself as intelligent, what does that mean? What does it mean to be smart? The ability high to, IQ. High IQ, okay. The ability to um, have assimilate information in your brain. To be able to assimilate information, using some Piagetian uh, terminology there, assimilation. So to be able to learn something new and to be able to do something with it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, if you have a high IQ, what does that mean? You're pretty smart. Mm -hmm. You're pretty smart, okay. Um, you're pretty good with critical thinking. Critical thinking, okay. So now we've got something that is a bit more concrete, okay. You're building, although it's not super concrete, but you can measure critical thinking skills, right? So you could, for instance, on when you take the SAT, which by the way is just an IQ test, um, but we pretend it's something different, but they're just measuring your IQ to see how smart you are. So one of the critical thinking measures is you read a story and then you answer certain questions about it. And they try to see how well can you think things through in the story. So we can measure critical thinking. Is critical thinking all there is to intelligence? No. No, what else? You know, obviously, it's a big part of it. Creativity. Okay, is creativity and intelligence the same thing? Do they go together? Yes. yes. Okay. So we'll be talking about that as well. Okay. Is it a type of intelligence, or is it actually intelligence? Are they connected? I think it's are, a type of intelligence. The type of intelligence. So then, are there multiple types of intelligence? Yes, there are. Uh -huh. Very certain. Yes. <laughs> And don't tell me there aren't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a bad review on rate length of Um So that's one of the things we're going to talk about too. Most intelligence theorists believe that there are multiple types of intelligences, um, but that is not not every theory subscribes to that. Um, for instance, Charles Spearman believes there is just a general intelligence, and there's specific skills that build off of that, but there is still just a general intelligence that people have or don't have or somewhere in the middle. Okay, So intelligence is something that we call um, a concept. Intelligence is not, not a thing. Like you can't point to somebody and say, oh look, there's their intelligence and it's big. Right? Like you could for their nose. Um, so intelligence is just a bunch of ideas of what we think constitutes somebody that is smart. So critical thinking, reading skills, mathematical skills, um, uh, reading comprehension, things like that, are what we sort of bind together and say, this is intelligence. So you can't truly measure intelligence. You can only measure the things that we say makes up intelligence. And there's a lot of debate about what actually makes up intelligence. For instance, is musical ability intelligence? Yes. Or is it just a skill? And it's separate from intelligence. It's an intelligence. It is an intelligence. She's very confident about this. <laughs> Um, you would like Howard Gardner, then. He had the biggest theory. Like See, there you go. <laughs> Gardner, right, right there. All right, well, if you don't remember that from Psych 101, we'll get into it. So some of this will be a bit of a review from Psych 101, and then we'll get into the specific areas of how we develop our intelligence, okay? All right, so um, we talked about IQ, right, which is 
the intelligence quotient. Quotient means an amount. So how much intelligence do you have? And the IQ score is a modern idea that we have only had since the 20th century, the 1900s. And so we, we really didn't think about measuring intelligence before then. I mean, there was discussion about intelligence and how smart people were and how you can tell, but nobody had come up with an examination process and an exact score to determine how smart you were in relation to the people around you. And so that is what the IQ score is. And of course, if you're going to eliminate certain people based on a lack of IQ, then you need to have a really good, consistent way of determining their IQ score. So the eugenicists were all, all into this idea. Now, not everybody who studied intelligence was a eugenicist. Let me just put it out there. Um, the first people who came up with an IQ, with the uh, first intelligence test, were not on that boat. But Now, what the IQ score is has changed over time, and we'll, we're going to talk a bit about the history of the intelligence test. Okay? So, the first um, theorists, or the first people to develop the idea of intelligence was Alfred Binet and Theodore Simmel, two French guys in the early 1900s. It was 1911-ish, 1904 to 1911. And, like I said, they wanted to identify the students that were doing poorly. So who was struggling in the school system and how do we get them the help and tutoring that they needed to catch up to the rest of the kids? And they, what they did is they went around and they tested a bunch of kids to see what was normal. What was normal for a 10-year-old? What was normal for a 5-year-old? What's normal for a 15-year-old? And they came up with this idea of mental age and chronological age. So you chronologically, you are 22, whatever age you are right now. But mentally, you may not be that age. You may be more advanced, or you may be less advanced. If you suffer from some form of mental retardation, then you would have a much lower mental age than your chronological age. Um, if you are a genius, then your mental age is way more advanced than your chronological age. And so it was this really interesting way to be able to tell if people were slower or ahead of the, the curve. The problem with this is that once your chronological age changed, your paperwork still had the same mental age on it. And so it's, it looked weird. So let's say you took the test when you were eight and you're perfectly average, so you have chronological age of eight and mental age of eight, and now you apply for college and you're 17 and your paperwork says you have a mental age of eight, right? So the, the universities and researchers and so on, would, it was a headache to try to go back to the original paperwork, what age were you when you took the test, and in comparison to that, what would be your current mental age? And so it was kind of the original test was a bit of a headache. So of course, we changed it with a guy named Lewis Terman, who was from Stanford University. And he imported this test from France and um, Americanized it, translated it into English, uh, changed some of the cultural questions so that it made sense for Americans. And I don't know why Simone got um, kicked off, but he gave credit to Stanford University, probably because they gave him a grant. Um, and so he's sucking up to them for more money. But he called it the Stanford Binet. And he also extended the age range. So instead of just for elementary school age kids, he expanded it from two years old to adult. And the Stanford Binet is still used today as an IQ test. It's not, not in its original format, <coughs> but it has it's still being used. Questions have just been modified over the years to reflect like new cultural developments. And they've worked really hard to take any cultural bias out of it. Um, so for instance, the cultural bias in the IQ, one of the first questions, um, or one of the questions on the first uh, Stanford Binet was, when Hamlet says to be or not to be, that is the question. What was he talking about? What was he debating? Suicide. Suicide. How many of you knew that? couple of you, okay? The rest of you, are you stupid? <laughs> no. Maybe. I mean, I just because you don't know the answer to that, we can't determine what your intelligence level is. You may just have never read Hamlet. 
You may not have had a good teacher who taught you how to analyze Shakespeare or how to even understand Shakespeare in English. I know in my high school, my English teachers were terrible. I mean, we watched Romeo and Juliet the movie, but we certainly never did any analysis. Um, I was just lucky that my mom has a PhD and my dad was literally a rocket scientist. He worked on missiles for the Department of Defense. Um, and they were like, here, they literally had a Shakespeare book this thick, literally, I'm not even making that up, with every single play and sonnet and everything he ever wrote and said, like this high, you need to read Shakespeare. So they made all of us kids read it, even though, like, at six years old, there's no way to understand Shakespeare. But um, if you want to make sound kids smart, huh? That doesn't sound doesn't Danish. Sound Danish. No, <laughs> my parents were not. Definitely, were not Danish. My parents were Irish. They're like, if you're traumatized for life, I don't care as long as you have a good job and you're making money. As that's all. That's the Irish way. Um, and you play an instrument. Those are the important things. You need to understand poetry. You need to understand music, and you need to work hard. If you're a woman, if you're a man, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's the Irish culture. So. If you did not have crazy parents like mine, who I love here, by the way, uh, then you may never have experienced Shakespeare. If you grew up in the California uh, school system, then you definitely have not been educated well enough with Shakespeare. So if I ask you a question about Shakespeare, all that is a reflection of is cultural bias, whether you have experienced it or not. If you grew up in an area or a situation where you were better educated, then you would have more general knowledge, but that still doesn't reflect your intelligence, okay? So they have tried over the years to really drop out all of that cultural bias so that it's a more accurate reflection of your intelligence. And they've done a really good job. They have um, diversity committees to work on the IQ test to try to make sure it reflects all the cultures in America. Yeah. Yet, um, with all of that um, reframing of the test, they are not giving it to black students in school. They are not? They are not giving. It's against the law to give a black student an IQ test. Really? Yes, it is. Our school Here. site will not test a black child using any kind of... Uh, is that a school policy or is that no, actual state, 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 state law? law. Yeah. That's interesting. I've never heard that. Um, because of the cultural bias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you look at IQ tests, um, this is later on down the road in my slide, but we'll skip ahead. So if you look at average white IQs in America, if you go to other countries, this is different. So this is just American culture. White Americans, on average, have a, a few points higher IQ than black Americans. Um, so there is, there is a gap. Now, is that because of genetics? Is that actually because of race? No, because if you look at whites and blacks in other countries where there's less racism, you don't see that gap. And where there's more affluence in black society, you don't see that gap. And even in American society, if you look at those scores and you eliminate um, like income difference, if you eliminate like divorced family, single parents, and you just compare like a perfect, like still married parents, um, same income level, like say middle class on um, both white and black group, um, you know, things like that, no drug use, living in the same area, then there's zero, uh, zero difference in IQ scores. So the only reason why we see a gap is because there's some disparity in um, environmental situations on average. But if you look at like trailer trash white people versus ghetto black people, same IQ. Rich white people versus rich black people, same IQ. Single parent white people versus single parent black people, same IQ. There's, so it's really just an environmental factor that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's an interesting preventive measure to, like I would never measure the IQ for my kids. When I was in elementary school, my school wanted to do an IQ test, and my mom said, absolutely not. What would be the point of that? I already think she's smart. You guys already think she's smart. So if you think she's smart, you're going to treat her better. But if she comes up with a low IQ score, then you're going to treat her differently now. So what would be the advantage? It could only end up hurting her for you to know the IQ. Um, on the other hand, I guess if they think that you're not smart and then you get a good IQ, that could be helpful. But in general, I think the risk is would outweigh the benefits. So, yeah. All right. Um, so then we had the Weschler. Um, David Weschler took the um, Stanford Binet, and he really like made this a great test. So the Weschler is the gold standard of IQ testing. It has the least cultural bias, and the really nice thing is that 
it has separate tests for children and adults. So if you took the Stanford Binet, if you took the same test at this age as you would be taking when you were two. And it's just one series of questions, and you take the question, you answer questions as long as you can, and where you stop determines your IQ score, which is sort of an inefficient method. So the lecturer said, why, why not just have two separate tests? That makes a lot more sense. He also divided the tests into two subtests, which is the performance and verbal subtests. So he said, we're already testing this stuff, but let's separate it into different tests so we can more easily um, <coughs> give test taking, give the test to people. You can have breaks in between the tests. Um, you can score it easier. So the verbal subtest is just like the SAT. The SAT mimics the Weschler. So you take vocabulary questions, reading comprehension questions, and so on. And then you take the math part of it, um, which, of course, is mathematical questions, you know, like, here's a series of numbers, what comes next? And you also have spatial reasoning skills, like, if there was this weird box and you unfolded it, which unfolded box would it match? And so you have to think three-dimensionally. So those are all the types of questions in the performance subtest. Um, I did much better in verbal forms, math and spatial reasoning, especially spatial reasoning is not my thing. Like, if, you go, if I go shopping in the mall, as soon as I walk out of the store, I have no idea which direction I came from. Anybody else like that? You get lost in it. Yeah? Okay. You're like that too? Yeah. So you, we would probably, anybody raise their hand, probably performed a little bit lower in performance. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> So if you are going to take an IQ test today, chances are you will be given the Weschler. Stanford Binet is still given, but the Weschler is considered the best. Now, there, it's amazing what can influence our performance on a test. And of course, if it is an IQ test, then you have to be really careful to not do something to the test taker that would change their grade. So for instance, there's something called stereotype threat, which is a well-researched Phenomenal. If you have to mark your race or gender on the test, which we do, right? How many tests have you taken where you have to tell them what your gender or your race is? If you are in a minority group, then that on it lowers your um, your grade or your score on the test by a significant amount. So if you're black or Mexican and you have to mark that you're black or Mexican. The, the belief is that it causes you a sort of anxiety because now you feel like you have to do well in order to represent your group. If you're female, then that also um, affects your grade. If you're white or you're male in general, then that boosts it because in general, you're thought of as a group that does better in life, although it's not necessarily the case, but that is sort of the stereotype that we have. Uh, now, it's not a huge difference, but there is a significant change in score if you are put in that situation. Other things that could affect it, if you are black and there's a picture of a poster of Obama on the wall, that will boost your score. Because now it's like you have this inspirational picture that, will, that makes you think like, yeah, somebody else did great in life, I can do great. And that makes you feel more confident. If, um, if you are a woman and there's like, a female astronaut on the wall, then you do better. Um, if you are black and there's like um, Nixon or JFK or I don't know Trump on the wall, then that lowers your score. So it's amazing how influential just these little environmental factors are. So there's tons of rules for IQ testing, which is why it's very expensive to do a real IQ test of somebody. There's rules when you set up a table, the paper and the pencil, you have to measure the distance they are. I mean, everything has to be exactly standardized. There's huge requirements about what the room will look like, what's on the walls. It, oh, I think they have to take all posters down off the walls. So the walls have to be absolutely plain. So it's very like rigid about how to get these tests to try to eliminate all of those influential factors. Um, so if you are taking an IQ test on Facebook, Probably not accurate, okay. Um, all right, so that's the Weschler. Now this is what we call the normal curve. So these are the results of the IQ test, which by the way, I didn't, I must have taken, must have accidentally deleted a slide. So you can see on here, the average IQ score is 100. So how do we get from mental age to these numbers? Because obviously, 
Well, I mean, I guess you have a 100-year-old taking an IQ test, but by the time you get to that age, you probably don't care what your IQ is anymore. So what they did was, because the mental age was so problematic, they came up with this way to standardize the IQ score. So they took the mental age, divided it by the chronological age, and multiplied it by 100. So if you are an 8-year-old with a mental age of 8, 8 divided by 8 is? 64. Divided, divided, divide, not multiplied. 1, okay? Times 100? 100. You guys are worrying me. Um, <laughs> so if you are 10 and your mental age of 10, you're perfectly average, still 100. If you're 20 and you're perfectly average with a mental age of 20, still 100. So now, no matter what age you are, if you're average, you end up with a score of 100. So 100 is the average IQ score. Okay. Now, if you are, let's say you're 10 and you have a mental age of 20, so you're really advanced, 20 divided by 10 is? Two, good, times 100? 200. 200, okay? That would be really, really smart. Einstein was 164, so that would be super genius. So that's like broken the scale. It it's broken the scale. 160. Yes, broke, uh, Einstein broke the scale slightly. I think the highest IQ ever recorded was 196. So you who would be... Who that? Oh, I don't remember who that is. He's still alive right now, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I think he's... Uh, like a theoretical mathematician or something crazy like that. Um, but you can see how the scores are going to really reflect um, your mental age versus chronological age without it getting screwed up by changes in age. So if you take the test when you're 10 and then you apply for college at 18, a score of 200 will, will still get you into any university in the world. You know, a score of 100 will still mean the same thing no matter what age you are in the future. When you're 50 years old, a score of 100 still means perfectly average, even if you took it when you were 10. Whereas the mental age, the older you get, it looks like you're getting more stupid, which is not, not generally the case with people. All right, so this is the distribution of IQ scores. The curve represents how many people in the population um, have that score. So you can see most people are average. Most people are 100. Um, and the high majority of people are within 15 points of 100. So 85 to 100, 100 to 115 represents about 75% or 70% of the population. So 70% of all the people in the entire world are from 85 to 115. Um, so 70%. 70%. Yeah, a little low, lower than 70%, but close to it. Now, this is what we call the standard deviation. How far from average are most people? And the standard deviation can be different depending on what you're testing, but for the IQ test, the standard deviation is 15. Most people are 15 points above or below average. So if you feel like you're not a genius, don't worry about it. Most people aren't very rare to be genius. Now, there are the first standard deviation, so you're one standard deviation away from average, two standard deviations away from average, three standard deviations away, etc. So each additional 15 points is another standard deviation. Um, so if you go one standard deviation up, 115 to 130, you've got about 14% and 14%. So the next 30% of the population, close to 30% of the population, is an additional 15 points below or above. So almost the entire population <coughs> of the world is within these first two standard deviations. So if you get above or below that, very, very tiny percentage of the population. So you've got the third standard deviation, 130 to 145, about 2%, unfortunately for this also, because now you're in the mental retardation level, 70 and below is mentally retarded, 2% in the third standard deviation. So 4% of the population is um, down that low. <coughs> uh, 
Um, and then the fourth standard deviation, you've only got 0.13%. So I don't even know what the next standard deviation of Einstein would be. I mean, it's so minuscule. You're talking like 0. 0.000 something. And then the smartest guy was 196. I think that's like six standard deviations above normal. So the chances of being that small, I mean, I think he's the only person in the world even in that deviation. It's so unusual. Um, on the other side of it, you don't go past 40. That's sort of the cutoff line because you can't, if somebody has an IQ below 40, they, they're not interactive. Like you can't test their IQ. So there's a certain level on the downside where it's just impossible to test what their actual IQ is because they're not able to communicate. I had a student once who said that she had her IQ tested and um, she said she thinks it was 20. <laughs> I was like, uh, let's talk about this after class. I'm pretty sure you're wrong. Um, <laughs> may not be far from that. She if forgot you think to do it. her division and multiplication right there. Yes, <laughs> yeah, maybe mentally. Mm -hmm. funny, but uh, yeah, it was funny. And she's like, why is everybody laughing at me? I'll tell you after class. Um, so pop, here's some terms that you need to know. Population, who is being tested? Most research is done on college students. Most research is done by professors. You guys are here. You need extra credit or a few bucks so I can get you to do all sorts of crazy things. Like two points extra credit and you're like, I'll jump off a cliff. That's okay. Whatever I need to do for 20 bucks. Um, I think the Stanford Prison Experiment, they were paid $200 to do that, to go through that hell. Yeah, it was like a total of five bucks each day. Yeah, something like that. It was really low. Yeah. It was a lot back then. Yeah, but not for what they went through. Yeah. I don't think they, they didn't even last past the first, Day six, I think. Yeah, the first week. Things, but yeah, so they got so abusive. Um, anybody not seen the Stanford Prison Experiment? It's one of the greatest experiments. Yeah, it's a great experiment. Um, okay, you can watch it on YouTube. Is that literally, be honest, is that only one person in here hasn't seen it? No, I haven't seen it. Okay, good. Honestly, yeah. Um, so, okay, then we might watch it later down the, the road then, since so many of you haven't seen it. All right, so the population is who you're testing, and this is important. If you only test um, people in outer Mongolia who are riding reindeer and um, living in teepees, then that does not represent the entire world population, okay? So you can't say, well, I tested these people, and that means those results are what everybody else would get. It could be, but then again, that's such a unique, isolated culture that it may have nothing to do with like a black person living in Detroit. Right? There's a lot of differences in those cultures. So the best tests have a very diverse population. Now, that's not always possible. Um, and some research is even done on animals, right? So you have a population of rats, and then we're trying to say, can this generalize to human beings? And sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. But you have to be careful when you're comparing the world population to whatever the population is being tested. Um, another term, mean or average, right? You guys know that. Standard deviation, we talked about that. How far are people typically from the mean or from average? And then the last term, oh, no, that is the last term. Okay. There you go. One other term you should remember is norming. That was the term I was thinking was on there. So norming is the process of figuring out what is normal for the population. And that can be tricky too. So this is why you have to take research with a grain of salt. If a research study comes out and says um, people do better in life if they eat chocolate before an exam. People do score better on their exam if they eat chocolate beforehand. Interesting, right? So we should all start eating chocolate. Yes, exactly. We hear stuff like that on the news all the time. But then you have to ask, well, what population did they test? Did they only test college students? Because that's probably who we're concerned about, so college students should have been tested. Um, but does that mean if, a, if you're an older college student, like, Let's say I had a student who was 70 once. If that person eats chocolate before an exam, does it help them? Um, how did they figure out what better was? Like, what is the normal score? 
and how do they compare it, you know, compare like improvement on the score to what a normal score without chocolate. Did they use that control group where they had with and without chocolate? Um, which good research would do that. I have seen research that doesn't do that, and I don't know how they got their paper published, because that's just terrible science. Because um, you can't know, like I couldn't, I couldn't give you guys chocolate on the first exam and say, I'm sure you're going to do better. Um, and I couldn't even do that with the second exam, because I need to be able to, it's a different exam. Right? Some exams, like the third exam in my Psych 101 class, students usually struggle. I don't know why. Um, so I think it's the most interesting chapters. But I've see, consistently seen exam three, the scores drop. So now I have a control group. Now I could give my next class chocolate, and I could compare their third exam scores, previous third exam scores, and now I could see if there was an improvement or not, because now I know what normal is. I've normed. The, the exam. Yes. Um, when we give our uh, state tests at the end of the year, mm -hmm. um, we are not allowed to feed the students anything. Lots of teachers like to bring in fruits and vegetables or whatever, yeah. snacks. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to because it does affect. Yeah. And I just, I feel so badly because I know that a lot of my kids haven't eaten, mm -hmm. and I would like to see them have something to yeah. eat because that's how the brain functions with nutrition. <laughs> And, That's interesting because um, now you're increasing the disparity between poor and, and right, not poor. Right, right. Uh, At least in theory. See, this is why we have to do research, though, because logically it sounds like if you didn't eat, then you would do worse on the test, so we should give you food. But we, do we actually know that? There are benefits to fasting, psychological benefits to fasting, so it could, it could actually improve things, although I would guess that it wouldn't, but there's My that population fasts. A lot. Yeah. I right. mean, they are, it's a Title I school, so mm -hmm. they are yeah. uh, economically disadvantaged. Right. And I really feel like, uh, you know, I'd like them to have the advantage of having mm -hmm. something to eat before yeah. a test. Yeah. But they say it's going to affect the scores yeah. and it has to be standardized, and that's an no, no, so. yeah. You think eating breakfast would be a part of standardization, but um, I don't control the rule. If I did, it would be an interesting place. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, does this all make sense to everybody? Genius IQ, we generally say somewhere around this. Um, above 145 and above is considered genius. Now there's like uber genius, like the Einstein 164, um, and then the super, the highest pop, the IQ ever, 196. But What's it take to get into the Mensa Society? You have to take a Mensa exam. I mean, like the school. Uh, usually you're looking at at least 150, 160 to get into Mensa. Yeah. You could probably, at 145, you could probably get in there, but it would be, you're still struggling at 145, yeah. Has anybody taken any Mensa? Like, you can buy a, a book of Mensa quizzes and stuff. I don't know. They're difficult. Yeah? Alrighty. Let's see. Got off behind on this. So, if we are looking at IQ, because IQ, intelligence is not a thing, right? It's just a concept. So, what would we expect to see out of people with a high IQ? This is one of the things that we look at to determine, is this a really valid thing? Like, if we're really measuring intelligence, do we see the signs of intelligence in these people with high IQ? Uh, successful uh, endeavors. Like successful endeavors, like such uh, as? Like a, they set out to, say, solve like one of the world's hardest problems, and they do it. Okay, so they're productive in their um, like inventions and advancements. Are most of them like antisocial? Um, you know, that's actually a myth. There are highly intelligent people who are very antisocial, but in general, no, intelligent people are still social. It's like the Big Bang Theory, that sort of. Thing. There are intelligent people who are like that and who are very socially awkward, but in general they do pretty well. What else? What would we expect? What um, would we expect of their jobs? High paying jobs. High paying jobs? Powerful. Okay. Powerful, powerful, powerful so prestigious jobs. Uh, what would we expect of their educational achievement? Uh, highest education. High education. Okay, they do well in school. Uh, what about relationships? Not very well. Mm -hmm. They put their success and not first. very well. Okay. They put their 
achievements before their relationships. For their achievements before their relationships? Okay, so let's look at what the actual research shows. It, it does show that IQ tends to be related to success in many areas of life. Okay, IQ tends to be related to achievement. Specifically, we do see that higher IQ means higher grades in high school and college, which is one of the reasons why universities want to know what your IQ is. You pretend it's, they call it the SAT score, but they're testing your IQ. Now, the interesting thing is that IQ is only related to college grades for freshmen and sophomore. It does not predict grades in junior and senior year. Why is that? Freshmen and sophomores take uh, like all of the uh, core curriculum, mm -hmm. and then junior and sophomores tender towards your career. So if you choose one, you have to like do more critical thinking rather than paper thinking. Okay, so there you could make an argument that junior and senior year is more challenging. Um, in my experience, when the more you go into your core subject, the better you are at it. So I actually found junior and senior in college easier. Um, how many of you hate your general ed classes? Right, at least some of them. Right? Because you suck at it. Right? Some, there's some areas in life you're just not good at. Uh, like I remember when I had to take statistics and of course math and all that. It's just not, not my thing. My psychology classes, like, easy. Although well, I didn't get a bachelor's in psychology, I got a bachelor's in music. But I took so many psychology classes just for fun and did so well in them that I decided to Go into graduate school and follow it. Um, so, yeah, you're my, in music, huh? my bachelor's was in music performance. Yes, last Where, where's that time? Um, I went to Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, they've got a really good music program. Mm -hmm. um, I did spend some time at Cal State San Bernardino, which is where I did most of my psych classes. And San Bernardino, I mean, you think that's not the greatest school in the world, but their psychology department is amazing. So, if you do want to do psychology, then don't feel bad going to Cal State San Bernardino. It's a really good program. And nobody cares where you went to college. They care where you went to graduate school, if you go to graduate school. If you stop at a bachelor's, then yes, consider the reputation of the school you go to. But after that, it's just graduate school. Um, so, yeah. So what else is predicting, or what else is causing a lack of prediction between IQ score and junior and senior grades? Why is it that intelligence does not predict how well you do in junior in senior year of college. What else would predict it? Your environment. Your environment? Okay, what about it? Hmm? Conscientiousness. Conscientiousness. Okay, so how hard of a worker are you? It's really what determines work. your work ethic. So for instance, when I did my doctorate, I had to write a book. That's, the, that's how you get out of doctoral school. You have to write a book. So I wrote a 175 page book. My dissertation is a book. Um, so I had to do research, and then I have to write a book on it. It's even it's published in the Library of Congress and everything. So that was the most miserable experience of my life. Because the thing is, when you're taking classes in your core area, you're interested in it. Oh, this is really cool. I'm learning about the mind and how to do therapy. And those classes, I mean, they're challenging, but they're interesting. When you do your dissertation, you do the initial research. That's interesting. And then you start writing it and writing it and researching and writing and researching and writing and a year later you're still doing it and you're like, please God just strike me down with lightning and kill me now because this is the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. And at that point it's simply, can you just keep at it? Can you just put your nose to the grindstone and just get it done? And there's so many people in the world that can't do that, that don't have that work ethic, that you can actually, legally, you can say, I am a doctor, all but dissertation. So I was able to finish everything in my doctorate, but I couldn't get the dissertation done. And that is a legitimate degree. Like, you, if you see somebody, um, they could have, like, you know, their name, and then PhD, and then it'll say ABD, all but dissertation. <laughs> the doctors that got my dissertation went down on that. But, oh, my gosh. Right? Because, I mean, the doctoral curriculum is still very difficult to get through, um, especially if you went to my university. Well, Melinda is, like class after class after class. Um, a lot of graduate schools aren't that class heavy. But so to get through all those classes, it, it still means something. Um, but basically you're advertising that I did not have the determination to, and the work ethic to finish it all the way. 
So, yeah, interesting. Or I needed a job to pay off these student loans. <laughs> that, that is a possibility, too. Yes, that is a possibility. I actually knew somebody in my doctoral program who was on his seventh PhD. He got in seven PhDs, finishing the dissertations, too. And I just thought, what is wrong with him? And he works. Yeah, I don't know how he paid for it. I didn't. I don't think he had a job, so I don't know. Like, was he a trust fund baby or something? Like, how do you afford seven PhDs? It's like I could buy a house with the cost of mine. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. Okay, so IQ does predict your grades, but it is not the only predictor of grades. And especially when now you really are getting into the hard stuff, the question is how hard of a worker are you? And we'll talk about intelligence and work ethic later on because sometimes being intelligent can actually be a disadvantage because things come so easy to you, you don't develop a hard work ethic. Um, job prestige and salary. Yes, it strongly predicts that. If you have a high IQ, chances are you will have a job that people look up to, president, astronaut, professor, um, author. You probably are not going to be a janitor, which is not that that's not a great paying job, which it is. They make more money than I do. Um, People who collect your trash generally are making somewhere around like 75 grand. Um, it's a well-paying job, but it's not a prestigious job. Okay. So um, if you have high IQ, you're gonna most likely you will get a job that people look up to. Most likely you will make a good salary, unless you're a school teacher. Yeah, that's me. Great. Wow. Yeah. That's why I'm here. That is why you're here. Now, marital stability. So are you more or less likely to divorce the higher your IQ? And surprisingly, you're actually less likely to divorce. So high IQ means you are more likely to have a good and a stable marriage. The smarter you are, the better your marriage. Now, does intelligence itself cause a good marriage? Remember, this is correlation. I think I see a lot of um, arguments about who's right. Could be, okay, so people who are highly intelligent, they may have more arguments. Um, although people who are less intelligent, they have a lot of arguments too. So I work in the domestic violence field, so I can guarantee there's a low intelligent people out there having many arguments. Okay, so those are the arguments, and then the higher intelligence would probably be debates. A Could lot be. of loud debates. <laughs> so what is, what is causing the difference here? Now it could be that there's just something intrinsically about highly intelligent people that make them better at relationships. Could be that. But research shows that there's more than that. What do intelligent people do for their relationships that lower intelligent people most likely don't do? They Listen. seek help. They seek help. That's a big one. Okay? They seek help. Listen, I would say there's probably um, probably a little bit more of that than lower intelligent people. They're less likely to fight over top of each other and ignore each other, but that does happen in highly intelligent people too. Okay, but they will go to therapy. Okay, Low, the higher your intelligence, the more likely you are to find a therapist. Lower intelligent people tend to be threatened by therapy and they don't want to go to it. Also, the lower your intelligence, the more stigma there is within your community. Um, so, like if you ask people living in a trailer facility or in a, you know, an inner city ghetto, would they be willing to go to therapy? A lot more than would say no, than if you went to like a university and asked all the professors if they go to therapy. And if you ask what's the attitude towards it, in the lower income areas, there's a much more uh, negative stigma attached than in higher intelligent communities. They're pretty much associated with divorce afterwards. You know, what? Uh, going to counseling in a like in a more lower intelligent area. Yes, it could it could be. There isn't a. There are some factors that could increase divorce. Like if you have somebody who practices really old styles of couples counseling, such as Freudian therapy, then it would increase your chances of divorce. Um, if one person goes to therapy without the other person, it increases the chance of divorce, uh, or it can. There's some precautions you can take to try to prevent that as a therapist, but yeah. And that could be a cultural thing too, like uh, sure. not hang, mm -hmm. on, airing your dirty laundry in public or something yes. like that. Yes, and there is a culture that is associated with intelligence or lack of intelligence. There's different cultures. So for instance, um, if you lived in the inner city ghetto and somebody was smoking pot, it's not really a big backlash. If you are a university professor caught smoking pot, you could lose your job and everybody would look down on you. Um, so, what was that? Disowned. Disowned, yeah. 
Um, I went to Loma Linda University, which is a, it's a religious institution, not my religion, but it is a religious institution. And so, um, as well as, you know, there's a lot of expectations of professionalism. So we had a student in our program that divorced while he's getting a degree in marital and family therapy. And they told him, you will either go to counseling for this or you're kicked out of the program. And he chose to be kicked out of the program. So he was, for divorce, he was, he had to leave his doctoral program. So there's certain cultures that are... It's been really bad. Yeah. All right. Um, so marital stability, they're also more likely to read a book about their marriage, okay? a self-help book. They'll go to Barnes and Nobles and buy something. They also tend to have more money, right? What about just conversation? They're more likely to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. That is true. They're more likely to be healthy because the smarter you are and the wealthier you are, the more likely you're to go to the doctor and take care of health issues. And poor health, lack of money, those are all major stressors in a relationship that could lead to divorce. So it could be the intelligence itself is causing, is providing benefits to the marriage, such as conversation, um, problem solving skills, right? That's a part of intelligence. So intelligence itself is helping your relationship, but also the side effects of being intelligent, like having money, being willing to seek help, um, being healthier, those side effects are also causing a more stable marriage. Okay? So this is why you have to be careful about research, because it, when we say, oh, smart people have better marriages, may, there may, may be other factors that are associated with being smart that are causing those. Why does that door always go crazy partway through the class? All right, so what else does intelligence predict? Um, well, actually, let's see. So when we talk about the prediction, the IQ only accounts for a small amount of the variation. We talked about your determination to work. We talked about culture, okay? Um, your level of education. So the more educated you are, generally that's also going to cause um, better outcomes in life which is a better job, and so on. You can have intelligent people who don't end up educated, and they don't see the same degree of success. So there are other factors that are um, determining your success in life other than just intelligence. Uh, your culture. Which culture is most likely to push you to work hard in school and to get a good job like doctor, dentist, or lawyer? Mm -hmm. Asian cultures, okay? Now, of course, there's a lot of subcultures within Asian. That's a huge generality. but Overall, uh, those cultures really push like education, work hard, spend a lot of time studying, whereas other, other cultures aren't like that. Um, I lived in Ireland for many years, and a friend of mine was considering getting his master's degree, but he decided not to get it because he would be so teased by his family about um, the saying that they have is, you have a big head. You think you're better than everybody else. That's why you need to go get a master's degree. You're, you're selfish and you're arrogant, right? That's a totally different culture than in America. We're like, yeah, education, it's awesome. We might be against the student loan part of it, but we still really embrace the idea of education. But in Ireland, you're kind of looked down upon. The more educated you get. College degree maybe is okay, but you're still really thinking you're better than everybody else. By master's and doctorate, you're really going to be excluded from your culture a lot, okay? Um, so intelligence is not the only predictor in success in life. So let's go into some of the theories. So I talked about Charles Spearman earlier, and he had this idea that there is just one general intelligence, which is why the IQ test works so well at measuring intelligence. Yes? Turn up, turn, make it warmer in here? So there's a general intelligence and there is a specific, there's specific skills. <coughs> there are specific skills or factors that arise out of general intelligence. So he did believe, yes, there's different varieties, there's different flavors of intelligence, but they're all based on this 
sort of general, um, general intelligence. So we don't need to worry about measuring musical ability or anything like that. We just measure the general intelligence, and everything else is based on that. So you can sort of think of like a tree with branches. So the tree trunk is the general intelligence. All the branches are specific intelligence. If the tree trunk is really thin, right, it's this weak little sapling, the tree branches are going to be very thin. If you have like a giant redwood, they're going to have gigantic branches, you know, coming off of it. And they'll be super thick and strong. So the more general intelligence you have, the, the more intelligence you will have in your specific areas. So he said we don't need to worry about those specific factors. If we just measure general intelligence, that predicts how strong the branches are. So we can just look at the IQ, and then we'll know that whatever area they specialize in will be good or strong or weak. Okay. So that's Spearman's theory. Um, so intelligence depends mostly on the general factor. Now another theory looks at crystallized versus fluid intelligence. Hopefully you remember some of this from Psych 101. So crystallized intelligence is the cold hard facts, it's the knowledge, the data, like what year did the War of 1812 happen in? 1812. <laughs> 1802. Oh, that would be ironic, wouldn't it? Uh, and then fluid intelligence yeah, is your ability to think creatively. So we often think intelligence and creativity are the same thing. The, uh, the people who came up with the crystallized versus fluid intelligence theory said that they're actually two separate types of intelligence. They're both a form of intelligence, but they're not the same thing. So your ability to learn information and even use information, generally speaking, is different than your ability to use it creatively, to use it in problem solving and to think outside of the box. Okay, so that's MacGyver type of intelligence. Is anybody familiar with MacGyver? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. All the people from my generation up are like, yeah. Well, the new MacGyver, has anybody seen the new MacGyver? It's not as good as the old one. It it's doesn't not. even have like a mullet, it's just not. <laughs> yeah, right. okay. It's going to keep up with the time. Yeah. No, MacGyver doesn't. <laughs> MacGyver creates the times. Sort of like, um, what's that other guy that's like when he does push ups, he pushes the world away from him? Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris, yeah, there you go. Chuck Norris is the greatest being of his life. Yes. <laughs> um, so, one of the distinctions that support, or one of the, the research things that support the distinction between crystallized and fluid intelligence is aging. As we get older, our crystallized intelligence tends to stay the same, but we begin to lose fluid intelligence. Okay, so crystallized intelligence doesn't suffer, fluid intelligence does. If they were both the same thing, if intelligence and creativity were exactly the same, then you would see both decline or both stay the same as we get older, but it doesn't. There's a difference between the two. So research suggests different areas of our brain are controlling those different types of intelligence. Uh, we'll talk later about how intelligence and creativity are associated, but we do know that they are different things. They're controlled by different areas of the brain, and aging affects them in different ways. By the way, if you maintain a creative life, you don't lose your creativity as you get older. But most of us, after we get out of college, we start leading a boring life. Like, we've got our 9 to 5, we're doing the same thing every single day, and we're not doing out-of-the-box things, and so our fluid intelligence drops. But if you look at people who are creatives, like if you're a photographer or an artist, then your fluid intelligence remains the same as long as you are working in that creative job. Okay, here is a chart of it with the age. So you can see college age, that's when we start to lose our creativity. And really, if you look at it, you know, high school-ish, is when our creativity starts to drop, which is not really surprising, right? We've all been to high school. Creativity is not something that is embraced by the high school system, which is unfortunate. Um, now, some schools are much more creative. Um, you could go to a creative arts school, uh, or just a weird school that embraces weirdness and creativity. And you don't see the loss in fluid intelligence while the kid is in that school. So, obviously, that's showing that creativity is very strongly associated with the environment. Okay. So, crystallized intelligence, doing good all the way into elderly years, fluid intelligence, dropping. But again, if you maintain creativity in your life, then you don't see that drop. 
Now, another theory is Carroll's three stratum model. So this is saying, unlike Charles, it's sort of similar to Charles Spearman. Now, I'm not going to get too much into it. You can look in your book. But there's like a foundational general intelligence. And then there's, um, I think, six specific skills um, in the second strata. And then each of those, like precise intelligence and fluid intelligence are some of them. And then she has 69 specific types of skills that come out of those. But again, she um, is saying that, actually he, sorry, it's Carol, but it's still a guy, because um, it's the last name. He is saying that it's still based on general intelligence. He identified many specific types of intelligences out there. Musical ability is one of them. Um, but there's still, you can still just measure the IQ and determine how smart somebody is. Okay, so a lot of research is still saying basic one intelligence. There might be specific things out there, but we don't really need to worry about it. Yeah. Now, Gardner, this is Cindy's favorite. Howard Gardner said that there are distinct intelligences and we are missing things if we do not measure them individually. You cannot determine if somebody is smart by simply measuring their verbal skills or even their mathematical skills or even both of those. You're still missing many other areas. And he did research that identified, he said nine forms of intelligence. One of them is debated and we'll talk about that later on. First one is linguistic, which is what we often think of as intelligence. Uh, vocabulary, reading comprehension, ability to speak and get, give great speeches. Obama, great speech giver. Um, Trump, not so great, whether you voted for him or not. I think we can all agree he is not a, an Obama or Ronald Reagan when it comes to his speech giving. Um, anybody listen to some of Ronald Reagan's speeches? Like that man knew how to give a speech. Of course, he was a Hollywood actor, not a, the greatest actor. In the no, world, everybody's but. not a fan of this person, but... Adolf Hitler was a great speech giver. Adolf Hitler was an amazing speech giver. Yeah. It's interesting because they've done... How else could you get so many people to follow your right. lunacy? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because uh, they've done research on speech giving, and there's two different types of uh, ways to give speeches. One is almost like you're a college professor and you're talking, and you often hear Republican presidents talk like that. It's much more like educational, um, unemotional way of talking. And that encourages thinking and um, sort of like a cognitive take to the speech. And then there's other people who are much more emotional speech givers, which is very good at motivating people to do so. Obama was very good at catching people's emotions and you know, revving up passion. Like when I lecture, you guys probably aren't, you're probably trying to stay awake rather than feeling like passionate, let's go out and change the world. <laughs> Um, Martin Luther King Jr., amazing speech giver, right? And he had that, the emotional, um, most, if you look at a lot of black ministers, they, they're good at that. Like, they can really get the passion for all of Hitler, passionate. Now, the bad side of that, even though it's very good at motivating people, that type of emotional speech giver also, um, it activates the emotion part rather than the thinking part, which is one of the reasons why Hitler was able to get so many people behind him, because it just felt good, just felt right, because he... He was so, so good at his speeches. He even hired a magician to help him with like hand gestures and the, the physical way of, of giving speeches. He practiced in front of a mirror. There's an old picture of him practicing a speech in front of a mirror to make sure he looked as well as it sounded good. Um, and he just, if you listen to people talking about when, when they attended one of his speeches, they just talk about the emotional aspect of it. Okay, so that is linguistic intelligence. Can you use your words? Um, in an effective way, which includes language, like if you're good at multiple languages, if you're a good writer, good speaker, those are all parts of linguistic intelligence. Then there is spatial intelligence, which is your ability to think in three dimension. What type of job might you have if you are high in spatial intelligence? Architect. Architect would be a great one. What else? Uh, like a factory design. Factory what? Designer. Like Factory designer. Okay. So how to set up the building. Um, anybody heard of Temple Grandin? She sets up butcher facilities, which is interesting. She's autistic, and she says that she grew up on a cow ranch, and she said cows think in the same way that an autistic person thinks. And so she designs butcher facilities that enable cows to go through the facility without getting upset. So that by the time they get to the point where they get killed, 
they're still calm and relaxed and not anticipating that something's about to go wrong. Is there true. data to back all of that? There is, Maybe yes. Really? Yeah, there's a lot of data. I mean, cows, I have cows. Cows are really stupid animals. They're cute, but they're stupid and dangerous. Um, besides tractors, cows are the number one cause of death for farmers. They're just big and dumb brutes, um, which is why it's a little bit more humane to eat cows than like horses, for instance, like some poultry do. Or elephants. I saw a video of an elephant hunt in Africa once, and it was just like, the saddest thing I've ever watched, because you could tell that elephant was thinking it through. And cows are just like, hmm, okay, oh, I'm dead. And that's sort of like their lifespan. <laughs> um, so anyhow, uh, there have been many problems in the past with cows, like smelling the blood and freaking out, or um, like Temple Grandin, I wrote, read her book, and she said there's one facility where the cows just backed up at a certain point, they refused to move forward, they were panicking, trampling each other because they were so scared. And she walked through it, and because of her autism, she sort of reacts to things just how a cow would. And she said when she walked through the facility, there was a chain swinging in the distance, and it scared her. And she said, just take that chain down. And after that, cows went through without any problem and weren't freaking out anymore. So, and if you're going to eat animals, obviously it should be done. I mean, death is not humane in any way, but obviously it should be done least scary way possible, most humane way possible for an animal. So her research is, is really interesting. But that is a type of spatial intelligence, thinking in three dimensions. So an architect, a surgeon, you better hope your surgeon has high spatial intelligence. Like, oh, let's get this tumor. Oops, nick the femoral artery. Sorry. <laughs> right? That would be a bad thing. Um, another type of intelligence is... Musical intelligence, Gardner strongly believed this was a unique form of intelligence. And if you think about this in a physiological way, is it controlled by a different and an independent section of the brain? Is there just one intelligent center of the brain, or are there multiple independent intelligence centers that can develop separately? Uh, and there is a great YouTube video that you might watch. It's a oh, TED Talk. Um, oh, yes, music, of Howard Gardner music. talking. Yeah. Uh, no, not of Howard Gardner, but it's just about the brain. And okay. how me, the music lights up all areas of the brain because oh, yes. you're using, uh, you're reading the music, mm -hmm. you are, um, you are feeling the rhythm of mm -hmm. the music, you it are really stimulates brain growth. Yes, mm -hmm. there are. You're listening. You're using all all areas of your uh, motor skills are being yeah. used. Yeah, because I had my Stimulate. bachelor's in music when I applied to enter um, Loma Linda University's marital and family therapy program. I remember the head of the doctoral program called me up and he said, you know, you did good on everything, but you have a degree in music and you've taken a few psychology classes, but you're not like, I don't know what to make of you. And I said, well, um, call, call up Harvard's um, admissions department and ask them how they feel about people with a music major. And he did he called them up and they said, we give extra points to somebody with a degree in music because we know that music stimulates the development of the brain so much that they have an advantage over other students. And even if they may be behind in some areas, we know because of the, the training and the skills that they've learned and their, the hard work that you have to be able to put in as a successful musician, as well as the development of the brain by exposure to music, that they, they will be able to catch up with everything else. And so he called me back and he said, we're going to let you into the program. So because I had a degree in music, I was allowed into this very competitive program. So put your kids in music when you have kids. Uh, the fact that we, music is the first program that's eliminated from public school is just horrendous. And you know what that's going on? My, my husband's a music teacher. We work at the same school. Mm -hmm. He teaches the music department. And, and he's always at risk of losing his job. Oh my gosh. And they, yeah. the first thing they cut uh, when the, uh, Art with the economy turned was the music department. Yep. And um, no music. Yeah. at all. And then uh, now they want to uh, divide the classes into 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, mm -hmm. and or 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And I don't know how you would do that with music, because as right. you know, everyone has to be together to make an organized sound. Right. And you can't just have, you know, guitars and then... And age doesn't and determine your ability. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Let me show you, um, there's a really interesting video about the school system in Finland. 